So who we are is um, small farms made up of four people. There's three locations, 55 acres. Um, and we started it, well, let me back up a second. It's evolved through a lot of different enterprises. And the current ones are apples, hogs, and sheep. And back in 2008, I was at the Lead Center at a workshop and they had a presentation on how to add value to your tree fruit. So that was my first experience with adding uh, value to crops without expanding acreage, which I think Vetter talked about that yesterday or last night. Uh, that's one way to go. And we're not going to, we don't have the skills nor the capital nor the land to scale that way or desire. So we started looking at value added. And I would say it was somewhat of a success, the Apple thing, but that led us to uh, look at other things. And I had some, a waste product from the value added Apple product, and that led us to hogs, and then the hogs led us to a restaurant. And then I started thinking about how can we make uh, better money with hogs, although our gross income right now in hogs is averaging about 550 a hog. Uh, but how can we increase our income? And that, that was through charcuterie. So what I did was, <coughs> oh, I wanted to talk about what charcuterie was first because a lot of people apparently don't know what it is. Uh, it's preserved meat. And we're interested in traditional uh, preservation methods, not non-heat treated shelf stable. Uh, heat kills just about takes care of everything, so that's a pretty safe way to do it. But the non-traditional method where you're gonna ferment, get the pH down in a, in a time frame, and then uh, get the water moisture down by drying uh, in another time frame to make it shelf stable, that's the one we're interested in. And it's the hardest because there's not a whole lot of it done here in the US and we've gotten away from that kind of thing. So in a nutshell, what this project was, it brought together a set of growers, small growers of heritage breed hogs. And we're all selling at uh, markets and we're growing under 70 head a year. I, I'm the, probably the largest producer at 70. And as I was saying, we're wanting to expand our, or increase our income and also deliver some mar profit margins and not the narrow profit margins we're all dealing with. But through the relationships I had with the restaurant and um, USDA processors, we thought maybe we'd bring us all together and explore the idea of charcuterie. So what, this is kind of where we started. We we're all selling small, or selling whole, half, or cuts at the farmer's market, a little bit of wholesale. Uh, narrow margins, if they exist at all. When I figured out my cost of production, it was 85 cents a pound live weight, and the sale barn was 45. So that's not very rational. And I'm also wanting to make a certain amount of money per head, and I'm trying to account for cost of land and, and equipment as well. Um, low sale barn prices. I have one friend that raises 5,000 a year, and their goal is to make $20 a head on the contract hogs, and that's not something we could do. First of all, the capital would require that I'm not willing to work like that either. Um, and our USDA processing options just keep getting narrow and narrow. We've got two basically, and that really boils down to one because one can't deliver consistently what he's doing. Within an hour and a half of me, there's a two. Uh, high feed cost, because of our small scale, none of us are growing grain or anything, we're having to buy feed and Customers are asking for non-GE feed, and I have finally uh, compromised my position on that, and we do non-GE feed hogs, although I, there's a couple of us now looking at maybe dropping that and doing something a little different. But and as I said, the capital, no, none of us have a lot of money laying around, which also um, brings to mind that uh, one of the benefits of SARE farmer rancher is we don't have R&D dollars, but this allows small scale people to do it as well as large scale. But I, I know we all appreciate the, the SARE program and it allowing us to explore stuff like this. 
And all of us recognize some demand for pasture-based, even though hogs don't eat grass, uh, hog production, and the environmental impacts. Customers are asking about those things, so it's a selling point for us. So a little bit of research turned up a couple of projects. One of them was the scaling up New England's value-added meat industry, and that identified some trends. This has been a few years now. Uh, something to look for was local value-added meat products and uh, in the traditional style. Uh, these are the two books, too, that we used uh, for recipes. And we just took those, the highlights from that and folded it into this project. Um, smoked, cured, dry-aged. If you can put that on your packaging, that's uh, appealing to customers. And the other thing about charcuterie is it's long, <coughs> long shelf life, premium product, and it's uh, high value, perceived high value too. Um, Copa, uh, Lanza, prosciutto, prosciutto style hams are $1.50 an ounce. So that was another reason we looked at this as the opportunity. But one of the past hair projects was uh, Farewell of Farm, and they were looking at how to just pair with a uh, small processor to do retail cuts just to show that you could produce more income per hog, which I think when we sell our hogs at, through the city market, uh, they gross 900 to $1,000 a head. So what I did was take, I also work for Lincoln University, have uh, kind of a non-threatening relationship with a lot of producers. Mm -hmm. And it was easy to talk to them about other Berkshire growers, other heritage breed growers. Uh, what if we pool our resources? I've got a creative person in the form of the restaurant who had uh, trained, um, experienced, he also teaches at the Culinary College uh, owner on board to help us with recipes. I have a USDA processor that's interested in adding this service uh, to th so that he can uh, increase his income and also create a niche for him, cut out a niche. And then I had Lincoln Uni or um, K-State's Dr. Boyle, the meat lab person. She was going to review our, she did review our HACCP plans and provide a lot of input and she eventually did a workshop. And then we also had access uh, to open source HACCP plans from, I think Underground Meats maybe has one online, a couple for the ground for uh, whole muscle cures. So the idea was we bring all this together, we get through the project, and in the end we have a pathway for anybody to go, any hog producer or even beef too, to take their animals to the processor and have a high-end traditional style charcuterie product they can sell, either because it's USDA, they can sell it wholesale, or they can take it to the city markets or their current customers, some of them are uh, selling on farm. So that was, the idea, that was the solution to increase income for all of us. So these were the steps we took. Uh, okay, uh, the chef created a couple of recipes at the restaurant. They had a curing cabinet and they were doing some uh, things with our hogs there. And we could test the market and get some feedback from people and reproduce the recipe so that we could get that down before we handed it off to the USDA processor who then would st start making the stuff in his facility. And we'd go through enough, I think we were, there was, should have been three iterations and then uh, uh, we would be submitting samples in to have the steps validate that we did indeed control the five major organisms. But so the USDA processor started working on the HACCP plan the same time they started working on recipes. And the difference between restaurant and processing plants for HACCP plans is huge apparently. And also it's not fully understood or uh, policed, I guess, for lack of a better word, in Missouri. So the restaurant maybe shouldn't even be making this stuff, but they can and nobody's prosecuting. So we started at the same time trying to get accomplished this uh, HACCP plan. And once he got, uh, the USDA does not sign off or approve, they just review it and sign it. Once we got that, then we could do 
the batches that we were going to test again for validation. <coughs> Determine the cost of production so we could price the stuff and we can price everything for a profit and place it in the marketplace as a premium product. And then everybody, every farm was going to have a labeled product and be able to go take it to the farmers markets and their uh, markets and sell it and get feedback. They could do sampling or whatever. That was the idea. So um, there are lessons to be learned even from failures. Um, and in this upside down, current upside down world, maybe I could say it was a success, but we did end up with a product, shelf stable, one batch. Uh, the USDA finally signed off on the, the ground uh, muscle product, which was the hardest of the two. You had either whole muscle or a ground product you could pursue. And all three batches uh, passed, so that validated that the steps that we have outlined to make, uh, in this case it was picante, salami, uh, they controlled E. coli, staph, uh, listeria, salmonella, and clostridium. And we ended up with a farm labeled product, one farm. So you, you can hear already that I'm, say, I'm using words like w it was supposed to happen this way. And we ended up with less than we were starting out for or shooting for. But some of the lessons I learned from this, and I'll explain further how this ended. Um, I, I'm the project investigator on this and went out and had uh, many conversations with the participants, then put together a proposal, uh, sent it back out to them, asked for comments, and I must be really smart because no comments came back, but now in hindsight I know that was because I had, maybe hadn't read it, or they didn't fully understand their part, or they maybe didn't even read it at all. There should have been some input. So in, in hindsight, I, I don't feel like I had the buy-in I needed from everybody. It was easy to sit and talk to me and say, yeah, uh, that sounds like a good idea. I'll do that. Um, I did then, when we got the awarded the proposal, gave everybody a commitment letter and then a condensed version of what I expected their part to be and what they were going to have to do, and everybody signed it. And I also gave them a copy of the grant proposal so that they could review that again. Um, I don't know that there's a stronger way to because I'm not going to get involved in lawsuits or anything, but a commitment letter I think is as strong a thing as I can ask for. I didn't expect to learn so much about HACCP plans or the charcuterie process. I made a few batches at home. Uh, I expected that the service provider was going to build on his base knowledge and um, I could pay him for those services and I thought that's what we talked about, but it didn't quite work out that way. And the USDA, because there's hardly any uh, uh, non-heat treated shelf stable product out there, and depending on your region and your uh, inspectors, not a lot of it has gone through the review process, and they are uh, resistant to uh, considerate and s very slow to uh, make any forward movement. I mean, you're, you're providing white papers to justify what you're doing, but it's, it was, that was the biggest struggle. The hurdle was, I know they have a full table and have other things to do, but we had to ask for an extension and uh, it was just trying to get them to re finish the review. But it finally got done towards the end. So they have a lack of knowledge and they have a lack of exposure. So the more this happens, I think the more, the easier it's gonna be. The first one was tough. Something else that I did not understand was the lack of, or the turnover rates in the restaurant industry. So my partner there, the guy that had the experience, when I went in to have him sign the agreement, he asked if his other partner could sign it, and didn't, <laughs> I didn't think to ask why. It's because they were splitting up. So he was gone, and there went the main skills, and I didn't have a backup at that point after we signed it and then I find that out 
And then every six months you're dealing with a different restaurant manager. So it'd be like this education process and then the people under them would be turning over and then there, sometimes there was nobody that had the skill to do it. You couldn't, you couldn't uh, risk it. Same problem with the processor. Uh, I knew him for about a year, had been taking hogs in there. I overestimated his abilities and skills and human resource skills in particular. So there's a lot of turnover there and I, I offered to work part time. I offered to rent the space. I offered to pay wages for the, uh, a dedicated person to learn the skills and be in charge of the project but they don't stay long enough, so that didn't, none of those options worked out. But I guess I'm hard-headed because I kept at it and we finally did get that last product um, through, but no sales were made. I'm not confident in what I saw, even though it passed, the validation test came back positive, I noticed there's spots that the, the curing salt does not appear to have gotten to, and they are backpacked. So that's a anaerobic environment. So potentially, uh, what is it, staff? I think creating botulism. So, um, so that's how our project ended, and we have out of that. There's a couple of paths we could go, and right now uh, there's I now have a person that has a meat distribution company spent five years in uh, Italy learning the skills and that's what he wants to do but he's not can't finance it we still have the producers in, interested and uh, now we have I have a curing cabinet and the innovation it's a commercial kitchen the innovation center has warehouse space we can house the curing cabinet a drying cabinet there and uh, they've had meat products come through they've written HACCPs for meat products, although they were heat treated. So there's still a group out of this and this, what we're looking at now is a little different arrangement, not the coalition, but a little more of a, a brand where people have ownership in it. Um, and we have control of what's happening. So that's where we're at. And I say the ha I have the happiest talks because our first value added product was apple brandy and all the mash, spent mash goes out to those hogs and there's residual alcohol, though it's really little. We also have uh, do a rye whiskey and uh, put that out there too. So I'm a uh, concise speaker, so that's probably pretty quick. Questions? You have to be somewhat self-critical. Why? What else could have happened? Well, I was motivated and wanted to see it happen. So maybe I wasn't assessing uh, the processor's skills as harshly as I should have, or as critical as I should have, because I really wanted <coughs> to work and my options are this, and maybe I should just slow down. So I mean, there were some other things like personal introspection that, um, I benefited from. So my uh, hope is that this, that method was going to leave a pathway for anybody that wanted to have charcuterie made to do it. Anybody that's selling direct, small scale, which this is a hurdle for all of us, could go into this premium market. And our first value added product, I positioned that premium and I wanted a meat product because many of the same people that are buying that will or express interest in this premium meat product to consume while they're drinking. And in wine <coughs> wineries already have our snack sticks and some cooked, uh, some heat treated shelf stable food like uh, Italian sausage and uh, pepperoni and things like that. It's just that's not high end. The, the margins are, are lower. There's no producer in Kansas City area yet, but o over in St. Louis there is. That's another option was uh, Saloon Badoo uh, started, I heard that they'd, they scaled up into a facility that's uh, with excess capacity and have been talking to them too about what if I bring you 10 hogs and we, you do copac. They're considering it. 
to use that up and to create more cash. But yeah, but there's, and that's something we can ship. I had a friend went to Washington, D.C., and it pulled up the, they went to a restaurant to eat and opened the menu, and appetizers, she snapped that and said, well, where's of the earth? But in there was La Quercia from Iowa that does the prosciutto. So people, are, it's something we can ship to the coast where there's denser populations. And that what we've been talking about in this new, uh, the next step is uh, how to, trying to understand people on the coast, the mindset and how they see the central part of the United States. And uh, especially in the Distillers Guild right now, there's a, com a conversation about this too. Because we have some control on how we market this stuff. But that's probably a little so over my head in complexity. Still a lot on the coast. Well, yeah, in Europe, yeah. In Europe. Yeah. It's coming here. It's what we're a little behind, but I think I think of it as the original deli meats. Mm -hmm.